I'm going to be very mindful this week that you have um, an exam coming up, so I'm going to keep this uh, recorded lecture um, fairly short and I'll PowerPoint behind me. Um, however, um, you can follow along with some of the um, points on the PowerPoint that is available on Blackboard. Um, so when you talk about the components of labor, um, your PowerPoint states that there's four P's involved. Um, ATI lists five P's. I just want to point out that ATI lists uh, position as the fifth P, or a, a actually one of the P's, um, whereas the PowerPoint lists position um, along with um, the actual passenger. Um, so that's where the difference in between the four and the five P's come from for components of labor. Um, the four or five P's would be passage, passenger, powers, um, the psychological of, um, component of mom, and then position. Um, position could be the a passenger's position, so the fetal position, or a maternal position. Uh, passage would be uh, mom's um, internal structures, um, pelvis, uh, the cervix, the pelvic floor, the vagina. The powers would be the contractions and cervical changes. Uh, mom's psychological um, component would be how she feels. We know that stress, tension, and anxiety can all inhibit um, labor. The passenger is the fetus, um, also the placenta. So anything that has to come through um, the passage is considered the passenger. Structure and size of the passenger, presentation, position, um, everything determines, um, all of that helps determine um, the, you know, the amount of time it takes to go through labor. So underneath passenger, uh, we look at several different things and we evaluate several different things during labor. The first, or not necessarily the first thing, but one of those things being the fetal lie. So when you talk about the fetal lie, L-I-E, um, you're talking about the relationship in between the fetal spine and the maternal spine. So there's two different lies. There is transverse, which is sideways, okay? So transverse thinking that the fetal spine makes a T with mom's spine, okay? And then parallel would be the baby's spine and mom's spine aligned together. Um, so transverse lie, parallel lie. So if a baby is parallel lie, it could be head down or it could also be breech. Fetal attitude, um, there could be um, fetal flexion, which actually is what we want for delivery. So the fetus is all curled up, chin to chest, okay? It helps that baby fit through the birth canal more easily. Versus fetal extension, where the chin is not against the chest and everything is spread out wide, and you can see how much more um, difficult that would be for the baby to be born that way. Uh, presentation is the part, or the part of, excuse me, the part of the fetus uh, that's coming through the pelvic inlet. So there are several different um, presentations: the occipitate, which is the back of the baby's head; uh, mentum, which is the baby's chin; scapula, which is the shoulder; breech, which could be a footling breech, or it could also be frank breech, which could be the buttocks first. Um, that's presentation. When you talk about fetal position, you're talking about the relationship in between the presenting part, so what we just talked about, the relationship of that um, to mom's pelvis. Um, so say, let's pretend we're talking about the back of the baby's head, which is occipitate, okay, is facing, um, and that's the middle letter, okay. The first letter is which side of mom's pelvis is the occipitate facing. Okay, so this is the back of mom's pelvis, that's anterior, this is posterior. Say the back of it is facing mom's right, okay? So R, O, because it's occipitate, okay? And then the last letter for fetal position would be whether it is anterior or posterior. So the occipitate is to the right anterior of mom's pelvis, so this fetal uh, position would be an ROA. 
Now if we turn that posterior, it would be ROP. Okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that in class. Um, we also talk about fetal position um, when you talk about uh, the passenger, and that is where is the fetal um, head or um, occipital head or presenting part in relation to mom's um, iliac um, crest in her pelvis, okay? So if it's still up in the amniotic fluid, okay, it's not engaged in mom's pelvis yet, um, further from delivery, that is a negative station, okay? Once it's engaged into mom's pelvis, so you put your hands on it and you can no longer disengage that presenting part from mom's pelvis, that is considered a zero station at the iliac um, spines, okay? So zero station is considered engaged. Think of it as zero looking like an engagement ring. It's round, right? So zero station is engaged. Above that is a negative station, so negative one, negative two, negative three. So the further up um, baby is, the larger the number. So it's a negative thing to be far away from delivery, right, at term. We're, we're talking about term babies. Then once baby gets below that, it's considered a positive station, okay? So like a plus one, plus two, and usually plus three is considered um, crowning. Um, so think of a positive station being it's a positive thing that the baby is closer to delivery. So that will help you differentiate positive versus negative. Which side is negative and which side is positive. All right, stages of labor. Um, we have four stages. First stage being what everybody thinks of when they think of labor. So zero to ten centimeters is the first stage. Uh, the second stage is pushing. Third stage is delivery of this nice guy, the placenta. And then the fourth stage is the actual recovery um, process. Some books don't list a fourth stage, um, but we will talk about fourth stage. So those are your four stages. Now the first stage, since basically it's the entire labor, they divide it into three phases. Um, the first phase being the um, early phase or the latent phase. The second phase being the active phase. And the third phase being the transition phase. Um, I want you all to know the characteristics of those stages um, and what you, will, um, what you would see or how the woman would act in those stages, what her contractions would most likely be doing. Um, what her support person could be doing, and um, obviously what the nurse should be doing during those stages. Um, obviously, um, cervical dilation is going to tell you which stage she's in. Um, early phase of labor, um, zero to three centimeters dilated. So this is an example of a closed cervix or fingertip cervix. Okay, so it's still thick and it's still closed. You can't get your finger all the way through. Okay, so if this woman's contracting, she's still, if she's in labor, um, still um, in the early phase, obviously, all the way up to three centimeters. The active phase is four to seven centimeters. Um, so you can see how much the cervix has thinned out. And this one's really stretchy, okay? Uh, but I'll bring these to class. Um, of course, her contractions get closer together. They start to hurt more. Um, We'll go a little bit more in depth in class. Transition phase, 8 to 10 centimeters. You can see it's much thinner, and um, the cervix is a lot more dilated. Uh, maternal responses in labor, I'll let you read over that. What happens to blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, um, all that good stuff in labor. What are the danger signs in labor? Um, what do we need to be watching for as far as what do we need to be concerned about if it happens? Um, same with uh, fetal responses to labor. And then what do we need to be concerned about um, if, if something happens with baby? What are those things that we're looking for in labor that we need to uh, be concerned about with baby? Um, a little bit on comfort and pain relief. It's from, um, so I'm going to try to 
break it down as easy as possible, just so for time purposes. Uh, there's non-pharmacological that you can use all throughout labor, okay? It's for everybody and anybody that wants to use it at any time. Um, possibilities are endless. Breathing, position changes, um, you know, bathtub, shower, um, walking, uh, massage, aromatherapy, anything, um, you know, not medical intervention wise um, that the woman wants to use. Um, there's also sedatives. They're not going to use sedatives um, unless it's very, very early on because obviously um, they're going to make mom very, very sleepy um, and they will also make the baby very sleepy. Um, next, um, IV pain medicine, um, opioids um, such as Stadol or Demerol, uh, morphine, Nubane, um, kind of doctor preference on what they give for that. Um, the big thing with that is it doesn't take away the contraction pain. It just kind of sometimes makes it a little bit more bearable, but they are still going to feel the contractions. They will be able, may be able to rest a little bit more in between. Okay. The important thing for moms to know is um, it can make them feel a little bit drowsy, and it does cross the placenta. So if it makes mom sleepy, it also makes baby sleepy. Um, so you always want to have Narcan available in case the baby's delivered shortly thereafter. Um, the baby may have respiratory depression. So it may not be an option later um, in labor if you're close to delivery of the baby. Um, there's local um, anesthesia. You know, if mom's getting ready to have the baby, uh, there's pudendal blocks that just numb the ring of fire area down here. Uh, for moms, but she still feels her contractions and all that. There's local that they can give for repair purposes and stuff like that um, after delivery. Lidocaine. Um, then we move up to epidurals. Um, so a lot of moms get epidurals. Um, as far as informed consent, regardless of what you've seen in your clinical sites, um, the doctor or anesthesiologist is supposed to obtain that informed consent from the patient. Um, we will want to make sure we have a platelet count on the patient before uh, the epidural. We will also, one of the main side effects of epidural is hypotension. So we will want to make sure that when she requests that, um, epidural that we start her on a bolus of IV fluids and by bolus I mean um, hang IV fluids and if you have a pump set it at 999 an hour that's as fast as it'll go in because um, you're going to give her a lot of fluids really fast and try to prevent that drop in blood pressure and we'll talk about how that prevents that in class. Um, then you call the anesthesiologist tell them you're ready and then you want to position mom for the epidural. Some position, um, if you YouTube epidural insertion, you'll see them lying on their side. Um, your local hospitals will have them set on the side of the bed and uh, lean over the side of the bed like this. Um, after the epidural insertion, obviously um, frequent monitoring of the blood pressure because of the hypotension risk. Um, Keep mom on her side to help prevent um, supine hypotension syndrome um, and turn her frequently, um, at, you know, every 30 minutes to an hour to keep that numbness equal. She's going to lose the sensation to pee um, because she's going to be numb. Some hospitals will just have them try to avoid every couple hours and some hospitals will actually have you insert a Foley catheter after an epidural. Next, you have a spinal. Um, oh, back to epidurals. They are continuously infused. So there's an epidural catheter left in the back. And just like you get a continuous IV um, through an IV line, you can get continuous epidural medicine through your epidural catheter. A spinal is much the same as the epidural, except you don't have that catheter in your back. Um, and it makes you more numb. Um, and spinal is oftentimes used for um, a scheduled cesarean section. And then you have general anesthesia, where we put mom to sleep. And you will only see general anesthesia used um, for true emergency situations in obstetrics, because once we put mom to sleep and 
Um, it also puts, we anesthetize babies, so we need to get that baby out as soon as possible once mom, mom goes to sleep. Um, for non-pharmacological uh, purposes, I'll let you watch the labor positions video that's uploaded on YouTube. Um, epidurals will decrease the sensations moms have to actually push effectively, so you do a lot more coaching when it comes to pushing with those moms. Um, so, I want you before class or even after class, um, when you think about your labor chapters, I really want you to try to picture nursing care of these women in labor uh, because a lot of misconceptions are um, that you know we we sit around and when the baby comes you know basically I don't know that we're just there to enjoy the moment um, and that's not the case um, you know we're constantly um, a charting um, but you know there's a lot of monitoring involved emergencies can happen at any moment so there's a lot of high risk um, stuff that you're looking out for and have to be ready for um, at you know at any moment. Um, just a few things you know when you think about a woman coming into the labor and delivery unit, things you know you want to ask her. You got to be a quick history taker. You know when are you due? Any um, allergies? You know you want to know what you know what she's been through history. Um, Unless she's bleeding, you're going to want to check her cervix. You're checking for dilation, effacement, station. Do you feel anything abnormal? Um, do you see anything abnormal on your hands? Um, is her water broke? If it is, is it clear? Um, do you want to know what the water, the coat we talked about last week, color, odor, amount, and time that that broke? Um, because meconium stained fluid is a, a danger sign of labor. And we'll talk more about that in class. If she's unsure if her water's broke, you can use nitrazine paper during the pelvic exam. If this yellow piece of paper turns dark blue, um, it means it's amniotic fluid. Uh, vital signs. You're going to take frequent vital signs. Um, you may perform Leopold's maneuvers to determine the fetal position. Um, fetal heart rate. Most of the time, you're going to put on um, a continuous fetal heart rate monitor and a TOCO for contractions and fetal heart rate. The contraction monitor always goes on top, and the fetal heart rate monitor goes wherever, um, depending on the fetal position. And I'm just placing these. This isn't obviously how you would do it, but I'm just placing these for time reasons. Um, things you're going to notice um, on the monitoring, and they don't have to be on continuous monitoring all of the time. But um, usually, if she comes in in labor, they want her. They want a good baseline idea of what's going on before they um, unhook her. That's just a general rule of thumb. Not always. Um, baseline. We've talked about normal baseline. One hundred and twenty to one hundred and sixty. We also note variability, which we talked about briefly a few weeks ago. We want that variability in that fetal heart rate. We want to know if there's any changes in it. Being, are there accelerations? Or decelerations? Decelerations, we're going to categorize into three different kinds. Early, late, and variable. I don't know if you can see this, if you can make it larger on your screen. Nice little acronym to help remember which causes which. Veal chop, V E A L chop, C H O P. V being variable, early, acceleration, late. 
cord, head, oxygen, and placenta. So a variable D cell is caused by um, cord compression, an early D cell is caused from head compression, an acceleration is caused from having enough oxygenation, so actually an acceleration is a good thing. A late D cell is caused from placental insufficiency, okay? And we'll talk about um, what classifies each D cell as what um, in class. But you'll have to know the causes and you'll have to be able to identify each type of D cell.